Okay, all set. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I now have the pleasure and honor to introduce um, the next talk from Jude Phillip. Um, so Jude, we're all very excited to hear about your living history. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a little bit of my journey. Um, I, I hope that uh, some lessons that I've learned along the way uh, can be beneficial to, to many others here listening. So I grew up in, um, I was born on March 25th, 1988 in a tiny tropical island paradise uh, called Grenada. Um, we're also known as the Isle of Spice. Um, many times when I speak to people, um, they always ask, where is it? So just to give a little bit of some bearing. So we're at the bottom of uh, the south of the Caribbean. So we're just north of Trinidad um, and South America. And um, there's many wonderful things about Grenada. So just a plug. If you know looking for a vacation destination, it's a it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, so in terms of my early years and, and upbringing, um, so I grew up in a middle class family um, on the island. My father was an extension officer for the Ministry of Agriculture, so he worked for the government, which essentially served as this um, the bridge between the farmers and the government in terms of training and and um, you know, different uh, aspects of agriculture. And my mother was an elementary school teacher. So um, neither of them went to college. They both finished um, high school and they did some certification training to be able to do the professions that they did. But um, they had this um, vision of education and their children succeeding. So education was stressed from a very early age um, and really, uh, getting us to think of education as a tool um, for growth and impact, right? Really the opportunity um, to be helpful and, and have that impact on our communities and so forth. So I became interested in science at a very early age. I was uh, very curious. I like to tinker a lot with different um, things. If you talk to my father, he'll tell you that I've probably spoiled every piece of electronic uh, in the house um, by the time I was 10. Um, what happened is that when uh, we would get toys, instead of just playing with it, I would open it up and then, you know, see how it worked, try to figure out how it worked, took out the motor and do other things with it. Um, so I really loved this whole idea of, of building things, taking things apart, understanding how different things worked. Um, so with the whole line of education being this, you know, tool for advancement and growth, and here I'm just showing a picture of um, my older sister and myself. I think here I was probably around three. Um, so my parents would always do this thing where they would ask us uh, what we wanted to be when we grew up. Um, and thinking back now, I think that question is such a powerful question, um, especially for like young children growing up, um, constantly having that vision of, of the future, right? Forcing you to kind of like think um, beyond sort of like the present into where you can go or where you, what you can become. And I remember from very early on, my sister always wanted to be a doctor, right? And she would always have, um, you know, this vision of, of being a doctor and being able to help people and, you know, take care of the sick and so forth. But I wasn't sure. So like some days I would want to be a police officer. Other days I would want to be um, a captain of a uh, driving ships and, and so forth. But I remember vividly um, around, I was about seven, I think, um, and we were having this conversation again, and I felt like I needed to get like a one up on my sister. So she was saying I wanted to be a doctor because she wanted to help people, right? And then I remember thinking, um, well, if you're going to help people as a doctor, I'm going to make the medication that you're going to use so I will help even more people because all the doctors are going to use my medication. And at that point, I didn't know who made the medications. I, I didn't have a clue of any of that. And I remember um, talking after, and my father told me that um, chemical engineers are the ones who actually make the different medications. And I remember at that point, uh, I fell in love with uh, a concept, this profession that I, I hadn't known anybody who was a chemical engineer, didn't know what exactly they did, but I knew they made medication. Um, so I wanted to do that. And over the years, I you know grew a lot in terms of my knowledge of chemical engineering um, and just reading on my own, trying to envision myself in a future that I knew nothing of, right? Um, and um, so you know, as part of that, I worked hard, excelled in in high school, secondary school as we call it in Grenada, 
um, and particularly focusing in chemistry and the life sciences. Um, my love and appreciation for mathematics came a bit later. Um, I always felt that mathematics was one of like my weaker subjects. And I think because of that, like self-doubt um, throughout school, I constantly felt like, you know, I wasn't really good, but I had to like work at it. And I remember um, it was after I had taken O-levels. So in Grenada, we function based on the British system. So we do A-levels in secondary school, and then we do O-levels, and then you go to um, on to college. Um, so I remember I had, I received a distinction in mathematics. And even going into um, community college, I didn't want to take mathematics um, as one of the subjects. But I remember um, one of the instructors, um, and she probably didn't realize the impact that this one statement she said to me um, had on me was the fact that I, I told her I wasn't doing mathematics. And she said, why? She said, because I don't like, because I told her I didn't like mathematics. And then she looked at me and she said, well, mathematics surely does love you. You have a distinction, so you need to do it. So um, since then, um, I, you know, started doing a lot more of the life sciences, physical sciences, in, in terms of just preparing for this future of chemical engineering. Um, and then my plan was to apply, um, you know, after community college. So in Grenada, everybody goes through the same path. So you go elementary school, high school, and then you go to this two-year community college. And then after that, you either go to university or you go to the workforce or you go to the workforce and then go uh, to university. So my plan was after that, I would get a job likely to teach in a high school, um, try to save up a bit, then to apply for loans to go to university. But then in 2004, um, my entire world changed, right? So Grenada was hit by a category four hurricane that completely flattened the island. Um, at that point, many of the people living on the island had never experienced a hurricane because the, the one previous was 50 years before and our population is young. And I remember um, there was a lot of feelings of, of, of despair in a sense of like, you know, what does the future actually hold? Are we gonna be able to rebuild and, you know, uh, thoughts of the future in that sense. But uh, through this adversity, um, it led to opportunity. So around that time, the City University of New York gave four engineering scholarships um, to four students in Grenada. And pretty much like everyone applied in and then had to go through. And I was selected as um, the one essentially to study chemical engineering. Um, and, you know, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, so went, moved to City College of New York uh, when I was 17 um, to study chemical engineering. And there I had a, a really great time I had uh, met really great people. I met my first chemical engineer there at, at age 17. Um, and it really taught me the importance of mentoring, uh, mentorship, networking, and the strengths that you get from teams. And um, you know, just highlighting three of the people who had a really big impact on me throughout my undergraduate degree, um, Alex Kuzis, who um, he was my uh, undergraduate advisor, who took me into his lab to start doing research. So I fell in love under his mentorship, um, Ilona Kretschmar and David Gossa. So those two I took classes with and also research with. And in 2008, I was nominated to participate in HHMI's XROP program. So it's exceptional research opportunity um, where I now had the chance to go to Stanford for eight weeks and then worked with um, uh, Dick Zaire and Ganilla Jacobson to really focus on nanoparticle drug delivery, which again sort of uh, reshifted my course um, in terms of thinking of my engineering background and applications to biology and medicine in a much larger sense than just you know med uh, you know therapeutics or so, but thinking of it, starting getting more involved in terms of cells. So in 2010, I moved to uh, Hopkins where I did my PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering. I trained there with Denny Wurtz. And I think working along with Denny, uh, I really learned how to learn new material, right? I had a very little background in biology um, and I had to learn a lot of it. I learned how to think and how to problem solve. And, you know, in addition to the, the great phenomenal mentorship I got from Denny, I also got mentor uh, mentorship from Jeremy Walston, who to this day is still um, a close mentor of mine and also Sharon Gerecht. And throughout my PhD, I became um, really interested in cancer, aging, and, and really the concept of using single cell technologies 
to be able to address um, problems with cancer and and, and uh, more recently with aging, which are now uh, key research pillars. And just to show a fun picture, um, this was us in 2013, um, where we dressed up as the minions, and you, you see Denny there as the as the the, the crazy doctor. Um, in postdoc, uh, I had this crazy idea that I would completely leave engineering and immerse myself into medicine um, because I felt like my engineering was really strong, but I need I wanted to learn how to ask relevant questions and relevant questions that could be impactful in medicine. So I moved to Wild Cornell Medicine uh, Medical College and was co-advised um, by Leandro Trochetti and Ari Melnik and really uh, moving into this whole space of lymphoma and tumor microenvironment and immunology, right? I'll tell you this much, the learning curve was extremely steep, um, but it came a lot from the pressure that I, that I was putting on myself in terms of not letting myself just take the time I need to sort of like learn and grow. Um, but through it, I was able to, you know, succeed through it. Um, and in a large part due to um, leaning a lot on my family, network of mentors and friends. And I'll just point out um, my amazing wife uh, here who, you know, has been with me through this whole process and, and um, really is, you know, helped me throughout this process in ways that I can't even describe. And also um, my com the community of the minority, of faculty, uh, minority um, affairs committee within AICHE. Um, primarily Dr. Gilda Barbino. Um, we've had many conversations on that. And then I went on the job market in 2019, and now I'm a PI um, at Johns Hopkins University. I do consider myself incredibly blessed, um, coming, uh, thinking about where I came from and um, my path to get here this far. Um, I get to combine my love for science, discovery, and mentorship and even though my childhood dream of becoming a chemical engineer was, was somewhat naive, um, I think it laid a really good, uh, strong foundation for my career path and really continues to drive me. And one of the things um, that, you know, throughout this, I kind of learned is that we should quest for impact, not only in the science that we do, but in the people that we can impact through the process. Um, so both our science and our presence should help really drive this change. And that um, the way that uh, people have poured into me, for instance, um, these are some of my mentors now. Um, I think we should continue to pour into people because you know sometimes you never know the impact that you know sim simple little statements can have on different people. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but my lab right now we we focus on aging. We use systems biology approaches and single cell multiomics to really study why we age differently. And I think, you know, that question that really drives me up, like why these differences in not only in um, our physical abilities, but also in um, the, the risk of certain diseases, risk of frailty and so forth. And we're really using this comprehensive phenotyping approaches where we focus on cells and extrapolate out um, further. And with that, uh, why I do what I do, this is my family. I have my uh, two daughters here and my wife. Um, they continue to drive me and my lab, which is growing. Um, we've been around for two years and uh, looking forward to many, many more years in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jude. Um, that was a really terrific talk. I'm going to applaud on everyone else's behalf. Um, and I'll also, I think, pass the baton back to Shri as I think we might want to keep this going. Uh, thank you, Chantal. Audience, do you have a burning question? Now's your moment to throw it into chat. In the meantime, I want to ask you, uh, Jude, if you would please tell us uh, about aspects of the outside of academia self that you didn't get to in your talk. Could, could you repeat the, repeat the last part of the question? What do you do when you're not working that you haven't told us? Uh. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so when I'm not working, um, so in grad school, I played basketball a lot. Um, now I, I started running in 2016. So I've run like two marathons, the New York City Marathon twice, and I'm running the half marathon, New York City half marathon in March. So um, I need to get back to training. But I like running. I like outdoors um, kind of things. Uh, wonderful. Uh, how inspiring and almost obligatory the marathon running for so many of us. 
Right. Uh, thank you so much on that note. I'm going to close the recording and hand the baton back to Chantal.